Well, have you ever had a decision to make, a tough decision to make, and you know as a Christian, you need to make the decision, but you need to go pray about it. In fact, you need to ask someone to help you pray about that decision. But if you're really honest with yourself, deep inside, you already have the decision made. I know it's the Christian thing to do. I got major decision. I don't know what it is. I mean, it's a major purchase. Uh, maybe it's a relationship you're considering. And do I go get wise counsel on this? And you're like, yeah, I better go get some wise counsel, but I kind of already have the decision made up. Or maybe you go to the person to pray for you to get wisdom and to get counsel, but you don't really like what they had to say. So you're like, well, they probably didn't hear from God. I'll go to someone else where I'll get a favorable answer that will coincide with what I had already predecided what I'm going to do in my life. Is there anybody like, like honest enough in church to, to say, I'm, I'm, I've been there, I've been there. I heard this story recently of a young woman who had just been married just for a few months, a couple months. And her, she went to one of her friends who was some spiritual authority for some counsel, and what she really wanted was her to affirm her decision to leave the husband after just a couple months. And uh, she was saying all this stuff, I, I got biblical grounds for divorce, and and she wanted this other woman to affirm it, to be able to say, yeah, leave that jerk, you know? And the, the counsel was opposite what she wanted. She actually got this, like, I'm so sorry, honey, that you're working through this. I can't believe this challenge. But you know what? I, I, you pray. Let's pray and fast for him. This knucklehead, he's just, he's just off right now. Let's pray and fast. And maybe God can get his heart. And she's like, she went right to her phone. Who's the other person I can call real quick? <laughs> By the way, here's what she said. He, it's not, he's not what I thought he was. It never is in marriage. <laughs> they always put their best foot forward, smell good all the time, teeth are always, you know, it's like, then you get married, you're like, what happened? <laughs> we think marriage is for us, you know, it's like for our peace. No, it's for your discipleship is what marriage is. Okay. Now I fired up. When I talk about this, this is really the context of Jeremiah 42. There was a group of God's people that already had their mind made up in a fearful and tough position. They were going to head south to Egypt to get protected. Wasn't God's best, wasn't God's will. They already had their mind made up, though. But they were going to go to Jeremiah just to see if he could coincide with what their pre-decided decision was going to be. Now, before you get judgy, <laughs> before I get judgy, isn't that, isn't that funny? You read the Bible and you're like, I can't believe they did that. <laughs> Every time you say that, go, that's God telling you. <laughs> okay? So, um, so before you get judgy, let me set the context once again. Jeremiah had been used of God to warn God's people to turn from their idolatry, sexual morality, chasing other gods, doing all those things. For many years, God was warning through Jeremiah, his people, he's like, man, I, I'm going to have to give you the rod if, if you don't turn. I don't want to do this. And he was patient for years and years and years. And eventually, he had to bring out the rod and give his people a time out. So the Babylonians and our King Nebuchadnezzar, they came down, they, they burnt the city, tore down the walls, they held captive God's people, brought them back to Babylon. Some of the, the poorest people King Nebuchadnezzar left behind, and he, and he assigned a guy named Gedaliah. Everybody say Gedaliah. Gedaliah was governor. He was Babylon's appointed governor over God's people of Judah, this small remnant that would stay in the land and take care of the land. Problem there was a gangster named Ishmael. Everybody say Ishmael. And, and Ishmael didn't like this idea. Ishmael was from the royal line. He was jealous of Gedaliah. He thought he should have been appointed to lead the people. And he concocts this scheme. I'm going to go take out Gedaliah and kill him. 
talk about like, like was it what's the the movie or the story or the show that you guys want? Is it Game of Thrones or something like that? Is that I don't know. No, no, no Christians watch that. Okay, good, good. I, I thought maybe some of you guys did. It just sounds like something like this. And there was this guy named Johanan. Everybody say Johanan. And again, you guys already read this. I'm just giving you, like, I'm just a briefing you, reminding you what you already read. There's a, a guy named Johanan. Johanan knew that Ishmael was going to go take out Gedaliah. So he goes to Gedaliah. He's like, yo, Gedaliah, I just want you to be warned. This guy's coming to kill you. Why don't we get on an attack and just take him out first? And Gedaliah, just, I love Gedaliah. He's, God bless Gedaliah. Oh, he's not going to do that, man. Let's don't do that. Let's all get, our, man, it's been, wor- it's just been bad enough. Let's, let's all get along. Well, what does Ishmael do? Ishmael, this, this gangster, gets some people. He comes into Gedaliah's place. He acts like he's all fun and, you know, we're all family here. And then murders Gedaliah, all the other people, and some Babylonian officials that were sent by Nebuchadnezzar. Wipes them all out and takes God's people captive. And so I'm just picturing Johanan going like, I told you so. And so Johanan's like, I got to step up and do something. So he rallies some people, and he comes and, and, and moves Ishmael, like comes to attack him. He rescues the people that Ishmael took captive, and Ishmael runs for his life. So that's the context that we're in. So you got Johanan, just imagine, put yourself in Johanan's shoes. He's like, oh, my goodness, get Eliah. This gangster could come, this, this terrorist could come and kill me at any time, and all the people. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he heard that the military officials got wiped out. He's probably going to be like, all right, I try to give him a chance. I'm going to come and, like, wipe everybody out. So here they are in this fearful place, and they're like, we just need to take off and go down to Egypt. They have it in their mind. It's fear-based decision-making. We're gonna, I'm going to take off. But you know what? Maybe we'll ask Jeremiah before we go to see what Jeremiah would say if he goes to the Lord and prays about it, which is always good when you're in a pickle, when you're in under pressure, you need to pray. And that's number one, if you want to write it down, number one is seek. Someone say seek. 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 Let's pick it up, Jeremiah 42, starting in verse one. It says, then all the military leaders, including Johanan, son of Korea, and Jezaniah, son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest approached, Jeremiah, the prophet. They said, here it is, watch this, please pray to the Lord your God for us. As you can see, we are only a tiny remnant compared to what we were before. Do you see his, he's like, man, we've been wiped out. We've been decimated. We're a small remnant. Pray that the Lord your God will show us, what does it say? I underline this in my Bible. Will show us what to do and where to go. Where to go. What to do, where to go. We're overwhelmed. We are, we are under attack. We are threatened. This is a tough position to be in. What do we do, Jeremiah? Can you go to the Lord? Can you seek some counsel? We need to seek counsel. Can you seek the Lord? What is his heart? What do we do? Where do we go? How do we handle this? If you're a note taker, a great parallel passage for this is James chapter 1 verse 5. You can jot it down. James chapter 1 verse 5, it says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and what? He will, he'll give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Another one, Proverbs 24 verse 6, I love it, it's so good. For by wise counsel, you will wage your own war. Anybody in a war right now? Man, you, you need to surround yourself. He says this, you know, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. It's so good. It's the beauty of being surrounded. It's what we challenge all the time. It's just what I talked about being in groups. Are you in a group? Just this week, it was so cool. We were part of this brand new group. There were two guys that had never been to a group. They'd been at the church for a while. And, they, and one of them, it was his first time showing up this Friday. And he is in a battle right now. And the beauty is he's been praying. He's been asking the Lord, talking to his wife. But guess what? He got in a group of men that have been in a battle similar to him. 
And now what? There's, there's power in that. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I handle this situation? You call out to God, but then you surround yourself with others. When you're in a predicament, I, it's interesting. My, one of my old neighbors, Paul, it, he, he got this diagnosis, this, this disease that was taking over his body. And the first thing he did is, is got his prayer warriors around. You seek the Lord, but then you get people around you praying for you, what to do, where to go. I was, I was considering this in my personal life, and I remember back when we retired from football and we had a decision to make. Do we leave Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and go to Omaha, Nebraska to start a church, or do we sign up and, and uh, coach college football with uh, coach receivers in, in college football? And we were like in this pivotal place, like what do we do, where do we go? And if I'm really honest with you, I'm like, I like Florida. It's warm. I like college football. I like men. You know, that sounded weird. Um, I, <laughs> I like to invest in young men who are hungry and ready to go. Let's go, you know. And uh, so we were praying and fasting and asking the Lord for wisdom. What do we do? Where do we go? And we just couldn't shake it. Go to Omaha. No! It's February. Go to Omaha and start a church. And there was this burden in my heart I couldn't shake about helping people become self-feeders. And what does that mean? Like, get to know God in your own Bible. All the way from Genesis to Revelation. Some of y'all showed up and you're like, we're in Jeremiah? Where is that? What are we doing? Why would we ever read that? I don't know, but God put it in there for a reason. <laughs> And you know what, how many people, just, just real quick, how many started reading the Bible when you came to this church? Raise, raise your hand real quick, on your own. That blows my mind. But why, it's, it's not so you can go, I know all the context and how awesome I am. It's, it's why, so you can really know God. One day you're going to meet him, get to know him now. And you can. You don't have to listen to a weirdo like me. You're like, I probably don't need to, right? I can read Leaving this church, but reading my own Bible. But here, here's the thing. We're in this place. What to do? Where to go? And so we just packed up. I remember it so distinctly. We were in this condo in Pompano Beach, Florida. We pack it up, and we move here. It was February 2008, 84 degrees in Fort Lauderdale. We get here. It was negative 20. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, are you sure about this? <laughs> What do, you, what do you call this to? But the beauty is, guess what? It was either Todd's will or God's will at that point. Comfortable or chaotic. What do you want? And when you just say, I don't, whatever you say, God, and you lean into it, I, I cringe to think what we would have missed out on of what God would, has done the last 15 years if we would have just got complacent and comfortable and just went our own way. And I wonder how many of us are missing out. And he, this is the right thing to do. Seek God. God's will, not Todd's will, be done. And so they do the right thing, or so it seems on surface. Hey, Jerry, can you pray for us? We really want to know. And so look at verse 4. Jeremiah's like, all right, I'll pray to the Lord your God, as you have asked. And I will tell you everything he says. I will hide nothing from you. Now, isn't that the kind of person you want responding? Aren't you tired of people that just are telling you what you want to hear? Isn't it good to just get someone in the room who will just, no BS, just look at you in the eye and just tell you what's up? Just shoot it straight for me. Don't, just don't even sugarcoat it. Just tell me, tell me like it is. Tell me the truth of what the word of God says. I think so often right now we are just, we're just taking pages out of the Bible. And ah, that really, I didn't really like that part. So we'll just whoop, whoop, whoop. How about someone just stands up and just, this is what God's word says. Right. Tell me, I, I don't, I don't want to hear it. Many times I don't want to hear what God says to me. That, that hurt. And Jerry, I, I feel like Jerry at this point is like, man, y'all playing with me. So I'm just going to tell you, yeah, I'll go to the Lord, but I'm, just make sure you guys know. <laughs> when I hear what he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deliver it just as I hear it. 
unedited, straight from heaven. And by the way, Jeremiah could hear from God. He had been predicting the fall of Judah for years. He had been giving these clear warnings, and sure enough, it happened exactly the way God had been giving it to him. So <laughs> their response, verse 5, I love it. Look at verse 5, Jeremiah 42, 5. May, may the Lord your God be a faithful witness against us if we refuse to obey whatever he tells us to do. Verse 6, whether we like, this jumped off the screen to me when I was reading it. Whether we like it or not, we will obey the Lord our God to whom we are sending you with our plea. For we, if we obey him, everything will turn out well for us. Doesn't that sound great? Hey, you know what? <laughs> whatever you say, Jerry, whatever God comes back, whether I like it or not, we're going to obey it because I know it's going to go well with me. Where are my parents at real quick, by the way? Wouldn't that be the greatest? Like, come on, parents. If you go, if your kid just looked at you, whether I like it or not, yes. I said last night, Saturday night, I'll say it again. Mom, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so often, I, I just love my mom's heart. It's so honest and after God. And to this day, she'll be like, now, I'm still your mommy, you know? Like it's, and she'll give me some, like, wise counsel. I'll be like, yeah, but mom. <laughs> God bless her. Let's extend a hand Lois's way real quick. Oh, man. Bless her. Whether we like it or not, if I'm really honest with you, man, it, it, this I fall into this. If it lines up with what Todd wants, if it lines up with what I had already pictured happening in my life, if it, if it lines up with my taste or my preferences, then then yeah, we're good, God. But if he if if I seek counsel and it's different from what I'm really comfortable with. I'm like, ah, let me go find someone else to tell me what I want to hear. So it's not just me. I mean, it's, it's the predicament of a pastor, too. Sometimes I get people that will come to me, pastor, hey, man, I need some counsel. Can you pray for me? And uh, I'll oftentimes I'll connect them with my assistant, and she'll set an appointment, and it's always Wednesday after prayer. We have prayer here. I don't, do you guys know that? We have prayer every single Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. up in the kids' room. You're all invited, by the way. And I always say, come to prayer first, and I'll meet with you after. I'll go buy you breakfast after. And why do I do that? Because so often, the answer they want, they already get in prayer before we even get to the breakfast. So then I just buy them a breakfast and we hang out. God already does the work. But I always get these things. I, I, I get these interesting. Here's a relational one I get all the time. Pastor, I've fallen in love. Is it the right one? <laughs> Mike, who am I? I'm Todd. I'm not God. How are we doing? It? And uh, but they're hot. Oh, they're to me. <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, and I'll ask them. Here's my first question. Ready for it? And maybe this is where you're at right now. Are they all in with Jesus? Are they just they're not perfect people? Okay. Is their heart, genuine heart position, I'm, I'm fully surrendered to God's best. Whatever his word says, I'm in. It's my first question. Here's, the often, here's often the response. Well, they, I mean, they believe in God. They'll come every now and again with me. And then at that point, I have a decision to make. Do I want to be like Jeremiah or do I want to be like lovey-dovey with people? And so here's often what I'll say. Now listen. Whatever you do, God loves you unconditionally. I love you, man. No judgment ever. But here's what I'll say. Um, if you want really God's best, I would wait for someone that they're already fully surrendered. So when you two come together, you're cooking with grease and you're moving in God's best direction. Okay? And then I'll say something like this. But, hey, but if you just want to get to heaven and you want to make it hard on yourself, like, go for it. And I, and I try to say that just really authentically because the fact of the matter is, like, God loves you unconditionally, but, man, there's something better. 
And sometimes I just, I, you know, and it's me. It's weird because it's me. <laughs> I see myself in it. And then, I, and then I see God's point of view as well. It's just what you do as a parent, right? That's the beauty of like, parent, like being a parent because you see the relationship with you and God all the time. Here's what's best. Kevin, Kevin and Bree, here's what's best for you kids. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Not your kids, of course. I'll we'll use someone else. And you get a picture of yourself. Not Turner. Turner always does the right thing, right? <laughs> what is it, though? It's Kevin and Bree's heart for Turner. That's all it is. They're fighting for him. God is not against you. He's working in you. We, uh, when we screen our 180 guys, let's give it up for our 180 guys, by the way. Y'all are, y'all are awesome, man. <laughs> we, uh, I tell the team, uh, I just, all, all I want, I don't want perfect guys, I want all in surrendered guys. And so, uh, this, this year, I think, did you guys say no to 10 guys? I think it was 10 guys. Not that they're bad guys, they just had to say no. They said yes to three guys who, and I said, here's the screening process. All in with Jesus and what his word says. There's no ifs, it's not like negotiating in that. And then whatever the directors and the people in charge say, it's yes, sir. If they say, hey, I want you to wake up, uh, run five laps around the 180 property, do 10 push-ups, recite this Bible verse, and then report and like, uh, get breakfast ready. You know, here's the answer. You guys ready for the answer? Yes. That's it. Yes, sir. I'm looking at you dirty. I don't know why. It's, here, this is your answer. You ready? You ready? <laughs> it's yes. Can someone say yes? yes. What, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. I, yes. Yes. It's, it's yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, God. What you, whatever your scripture says. This is so convicting to me because so often I'm like, yeah, but. So, so number two, um, your, Jeremiah is going to go to the Lord. And he's going to bring this back. And in the, in the word is going to be stay. Write it down. So seek, right? They're seeking counsel. They're seeking prayer. They're seeking God's answer. But number two, he's gonna, they're going to get this answer. Stay. Verse seven. So 10 days later, <laughs> 10 days, by the way. Ten days seems like an eternity sometimes when you're waiting for an answer to prayer. Ten days later, the Lord gave this reply to Jeremiah. So he called Johanan, son of Korea, the other military leaders. And for all the people from the least to the greatest, he said to them, Hey, you sent me to the Lord, the God of Israel, with your request. And this is his reply. You guys ready? Here it is, verse 10. Stay. Someone say stay. Stay here in this land. If you do... If you do, I'll build you up and not tear you down. I'll plant you and not uproot you. For I'm sorry, this is so cool, I, I'm sorry about all the punishment I have had to bring upon you. Don't you just see the heart of a parent right there? What do the parents always say? Like, this is going to hurt me worse than it hurts you. And we always, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, I... <laughs> I feel like that's what God's saying. I didn't want to send the Babylonians to give you a timeout and give you the rod of discipline. It wasn't my heart. I was trying to get your attention. But you're so darn stubborn, you wouldn't do it. Verse 11, don't fear the king of Babylon anymore, says the Lord. I'm with you. I'll save you, rescue you from his power. I'll be merciful to you by making him kind so he will let you stay here in your land. He's saying, guys, I know it doesn't make sense. I know you want to flee to Egypt. I know, man, you want to take control of your own life because you're fearful and you want to head south. You want to go to Egypt. Egypt is a type of the flesh of the world. And by the way, if you're a new Christian in here, it's getting dicey for you. So you want to go back to your old life. You want to go back down to Egypt. But can I just tell you, what is in Egypt? Bondage and shackles is in Egypt. Don't go back. He says, I know it's going to be hard and uncomfortable, but stay. Someone say Stay. Stay, stay, stay. I think it's the hardest thing sometimes. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? Like, it's so hard. I, in your home right now, it's uncomfortable. I know it is. I, believe me, I've been there. But God just came. He, you, he wanted you to show up to say to you, as hard as it is, stay. Your job right now, the easiest thing for, for most humans, and we do this all the time, 
when it gets uncomfortable in my current position, they're not, they're not compensating me well, they're not showing me the love, I'm going to go somewhere else, and we flee that position, God sometimes says, no, stay. Because what I'm working on is if you can have an audience of one that you can serve me, whether or not you get the recognition or not. Maybe that's what you need to do is stay. Maybe the sports team you're on right now, you're not getting the run that you want, and it's really tough, but maybe God's, there's this crucible of character development that's happening right now in the midst of the uncomfortable. What is that? Stay. I can leave, and by the way, here's what I found. If I leave, I'm just going around the mountain. God will bring me back. You flee one employer, and about to go to the same employer. They're just going to look different. God's inviting us into this place. The picture I always get is, is this umbrella. It's like God's big umbrella. And too often, and when I'm walking with God, under the umbrella is God's provision. It's his protection. It's his care. But I get scared. I start doing stuff on my own. I, I'm like, yo, God, I'll see you later. And I get out of God's will and protection under the umbrella, and I walk in Todd's will, and all of a sudden the torrential downpour starts happening in my face. And I'm carrying it all on my own. God says, okay, get back under the umbrella. Stay. Stay in stride with the Spirit. What does my word say? Stay in that principle. What is God's will? Here is God's will right here. So often black and white. He tells them, so that's what I want you to do. But if you don't, I just want to get a, a, give you a preview of coming attractions if you choose not to stay under the umbrella. Verse 13, but if you refuse to stay to obey the Lord, and if you say, we will not stay here, instead we're going to go to Egypt where we will be free from war, the call to arms, and hunger, then hear the Lord's message to the remnant of Judah. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies the God of Israel says, if you are determined, this hit me, to go to Egypt and live there, the very war and famine you fear will actually catch up with you and you'll die there. That's the fate awaiting every one of you who insist on going to live in Egypt. Do you see that? Determined. If you insist on having your own way, it's, it's going to go south quick. Don't make a bad situation worse. It's bad enough. I'm going to take care of you. Even in that tough situation, don't make it worse by going to Egypt. What you're actually looking for, will, it, it, you won't get it, and it will follow you. This chaos will follow you there. What's their decision? I'm glad you asked. Number three, just jot it down. This is where we'll land the plane. Like many of us, they were stubborn. Just jot it down. They were stubborn. Now Jeremiah 43, verse 1, when Jeremiah had finished giving this message from the Lord their God to the people, Azariah, son of Hoshiah, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the other proud men said to Jeremiah, you lie. <laughs> the Lord our God hasn't forbidden us to go to Egypt. It's Barak, the son, Barak, the son of Neriah, has convinced you to say this. It's all it's all." Barak's fault, right? Okay, hold on. We'll keep on going. Because, because he wants us to stay here and be killed by the Babylonians or be carried off into exile. Verse 4, so Johanan and the other military leaders and all the people, what did they do? They refused to obey the Lord's command to stay in Judah. Isn't that a picture of us? In the next chapter, in chapter 44, verse 16, it says, <laughs> they said this, we will not listen to your messages from the Lord. We will do whatever we want. In one ear and out the other. I was reading this and I was thinking, now why'd you ask Jeremiah in the first place anyway if you already had your, your mind made up? And God was like, exactly. Why do you ask me when you have your mind already made up? <laughs> F.B. Meyer says this. This is a good quote. Check this out. How often do believers ask for prayer that their course may be made clear when in fact they have already decided on it and are secretly hoping to turn God to their own side? 
I was studying this, and I was thinking, God made man in his own image, and then we just returned the favor. Many times, my picture of God is just me, more perfect and more, and more strong. Instead of submitting to who the true God of the Bible is, I become God. G. G Campbell Morgan, I gotta give you this last one, I promise you, and then I'll tell you a story and we'll let you go. He says this, it's impossible to deal deceitfully with our own souls. We do so, as these people did, whenever we ask for divine guidance, having previously decided as to what our course of action is to be. And this hit me. Such praying is only superstitious activity. Oh my goodness. Y'all are like, man, I should have just slept in today. I hope it's just challenging like it has me. I, I'm there sometimes, man. You can lead the horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. You can lead the human to the scriptures, but you can't force them to do God's best in their life. And so often, it, it just derails our life. I'll tell you this story, and, and, and we'll land, but, you know, in my own life, I, I, I'm in process, and I struggle with this, and this was a good word, a good challenging word for me. I'm going to spend some time with Pastor Mike these next couple of days where we can pray for one another and just continue to grow to whatever God says, whether you're comfortable or not, Todd, like, let's go. But, but the, the ramifications are so dicey. And this hit me recently. I have a loved one who uh, called me from prison. And this is the second time he's been in, and we just tried to do all we can to, to help him. And the first voicemail was, that came was, was, was um, how do I say it? This is a grown man weeping and out of his mind talking about, can you, get, can you just come and bail me out? He was in Egypt. He, he knew what God had called him to do. He actually tasted some of that for a while. He went back down to Egypt, and now he's literally in prison. The second voicemail comes, it's the same thing. Would you please, Todd, come get me. This is the only phone number I memorized. Can you come get me? In my mind, I'm like, man, this chemical has gotten his mind. This is the only place he can probably get sober, right here. I'm not going to go get him. Why would I do that? I'm going to pray for him. He might think that I don't love him. I love him. I love him enough to keep him in the darn jail cell. And the third one was like, okay, you're not coming to get me. Can you put some money in my account so I can get a candy bar? <laughs> now that I did, all right, church? So, okay. <laughs> but it breaks your heart, man. And I just got a picture of like just a small little snapshot of when God tells me the same thing. Why you got to go back to jail, Todd? Don't go down to Egypt. When you pray and ask me for, for direction, don't just fluff it off. Do what I ask you to do, man. I want something better for you. Amen? Lord, thank you for this word. So timely, and I needed it. I, I pray it helped a lot of us here. And I'm thinking about a lot of friends that are in Egypt right now. God, this place of, of bondage and uh, struggle so many of us, and so we pray, thank you, I mean, number one, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Even in the pit, in the prison, you're there. And so we pray you'd continue to reveal yourself even there. But those of us that are, are, are making tough, we, we are making big decisions right now. I pray for a clarity, a courage. Whatever you say, whether we like it or not, we obey because we know it's going to be your best. It's all we want. Your best for your people, for your glory, in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I want to wrap up, if I could, with an opportunity to respond. And specifically, this is on my heart. You might be joining us for the first or second time. Maybe you're online and, and you just came across this feed. And I want to extend an invitation to make peace with God. You've been running from God. You've been, uh, maybe you came up as a youngster going to church and maybe you got that picture. God's out to get me. He's out to get you, but in a different way. He's out to get relationship with you, to forgive you. And my point happened in my truck in 1997 where I finally said yes. And I want to give that opportunity for someone in here today. It hit me hard. We did a celebration of life service for my friend Ken yesterday and uh, 
I just always get a picture of Big Ken. He's, he, he led us in worship through the midst of the worst physical challenge of his life, the most challenging physical challenge of his life, working through a deadly disease, and yet he led us in worship with his hand raised to God. And I, I started thinking to myself, that's how I want to go out right there. He had peace with God, not because of what he did, but because of what Jesus did. The Bible is clear. God's perfect. God, God spoke the world into existence. He created you and I for fellowship. We're the ones that messed up. Adam and Eve, I mean, what did, they, they took the forbidden fruit. They messed it up. And now it's been generational sin and chaos has ensued. But God in his rich mercy and grace, he's like, no, I don't want to be disconnected from my people. I'm going to go on the ultimate mission trip. And Jesus came to this planet. He lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't. 33 years. And then he was brutally murdered. He was crucified on that cross, his arms stretched wide. I love that picture because that's what God's saying to you. Doesn't matter what you've done, I want to forgive you. I proved how much I love you by, by dying on that cross. They buried him three days later. He rose from the grave, proving who he is. And now he just says, come on. So let's stand together if we can right now, and we're going to give you that opportunity. Just come to him. Admit, you're, man, I've blown it. I need forgiveness. The band's going to play a song. Church, if you don't absolutely have to leave right now, just lean in. Uh, just give me two more minutes. Just pray. Pray. There's people making the biggest decision of their life right now. Will I say yes to God? Will I say yes to Jesus Christ to forgive me? To begin a love relationship with him. You can be like Ken, man. <laughs> Knowing exactly when I die, I know where I'm going. So be praying. God's speaking to you. Your, your time's now. I'll lead you in a prayer right here. God, open up my heart. I want to follow you. We'll help you connect it with people that will help you on the journey, surround you. Everything will change. Will it be easy? It won't be easy. It'll be worth it. Deep peace. Surrender your life to God right now. As the band plays, you come. You come. This is not my fight, you are my defense.